Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. The following is my full interview with Pantera recording engineer Tim Kimsey and Pantera producer Sterling Winfield, where they share a ton of behind-the-scenes stories about Pantera, including the making of Five Minutes Alone, I'm Broken, Revolution Is My Name, stories about Dimebag, Vinny, Phil, and Rex, the story behind Damage Plan, Pantera's Breakup, how Dimebag recorded guitars, and much more. It should be noted that this interview was conducted prior to the announcement of Pantera's reunion. As you know, I'm from Canada, and hockey is the big sport up here, and the Stanley Cup is like the biggest thing for us, right? So mm. what exactly <laughs> happened that night? The Stars won at the party. Yeah. What happened there? Sterling's going to have to answer this one. I wasn't there. I claim nowhere to be within 100 miles of when all of that went down. So, Sterling, here's the proof that I drank out of the cup right here. Oh, that's so cool. That's not you. That's some young guy. <laughs> hippie. Here's the deal. Okay. The legend states that someone threw it off of the balcony at Benny's house or that someone at Benny's house dropped it. I am not going to deny that story. <laughs> okay <laughs> but i will say that i believe the cup was dented before it ever made it to texas i also understand that it might have been eddie belfort that did that really i think i'm not again i don't want to get eddie belfort upset at me but <laughs> that seems to be what the consensus was from some of the other stars that knew Vinny and all of that stuff. So that being said, uh, it did go off the balcony at Vinny's house. It did get pushed to the bottom of the pool. They couldn't make it sink because it floats. Evidently it's all joined together and it's got air trapped in between the sections of it. So it wouldn't sink. Uh, those <laughs> things did happen that i can confirm i was there i saw it and i got the, and i got the drink out of it which was a once in a lifetime that's opportunity. awesome dude so on a different note do you guys remember working on five minutes alone hmm. <laughs> yeah yes. what was that like yeah i was uh, fucking you first, I mean, it all it all boils kind of together it all blurs together but no i i just absolutely uh loved that riff the way that 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 uh, that drum part was was just uh, to me was just it dictated that whole song, you know that dun ta, dun ta, to just this this hammering halftime beat mm -hmm. over Dime's guitar riff, and I just remember hearing that at probably in the control room there at Dallas Sound Lab on. 110 db you know mm. just as loud as these gigantic westlake studio speakers would go first of all we had to build these big stands for them out of cinder blocks really in the control room yes and, and we, 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 we were absolutely breaking every acoustic design <laughs> totally. uh, you know totally. everything it, that was ever put out there it's like screw that yes because that is the one thing i learned from the that these guys that I will always treasure one of the many things, but this one in particular of, of the whole philosophy of it's not the gear, it's the ear. And I learned how to make badass slamming music on cheap, broken, shitty gear, mm -hmm. not name brand shit, nothing you would think would ever make an album and that's how that's how they lived their lives because they they started out with no money they had to rig things together to make them work and that's why we called Vinny Riggs hmm. because he was the master of putting things together that may not go together or making things work with scraps and I just remember those speakers in that in that control room just we had that thing rocking and rolling and it sounded amazing and it was because they they said yeah just do this and we and we went and just did it and it worked i mean that's what i remember about five minutes alone was that that just hearing it for the first time through those big ass speakers in the control room when we were all pretty lit you know having a good time happy drunk and and just da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, that riff you know mm -hmm. just knocking your hair back 
And the other thing about five minutes alone was that I remember the day we were, we were in the, Phil had just put vocals on it Okay. and Terry had given them, you know, at the end of the day that we would always make a cassette copy of whatever. And the guys would take it with them, listen to it on the way home with their, on their little portable DAT machine or okay. their, uh, their little cassettes or whatever uh in their cars and you know the car was always the the thing and saying still still the same to this day the car is the is the if you can get it sounding good in the car it's it's you're good hmm. and uh he came back up the next day after the end of the night that night we were we were we weren't quite to mixing yet but we were finishing up all the recording okay. and uh he had taken that clip that you see in the home video three where he pulls up to that junior high and says, Hey, y'all want to hear some new Pantera? Hmm. And the kids go crazy and he starts, he's playing five minutes alone. And that's that mosh pit out front of the school and the teachers are freaking out and they're on their walkie talkies and stuff. And they're not sure what to do. Mm -hmm. That was from, you know, five minutes alone in the day after that, it, that song had all the parts on it and it was complete. Hmm. And, and and him causing that mosh pit out front of that junior high that was right by his house in the neighborhood that he grew up in his whole life, just, it was like, that's the power of music. That's the power of a really, really good piece of music. Mm -hmm. It moves you. It makes crazy shit happen. It makes emotions come out that you didn't know you had in there. And so that was a that was a pretty pivotal moment for me too, seeing those kids go crazy. And, and this, you know, of course this was a couple of years before that got put in the actual home video. He videotaped everything. Yeah. So, so you know. So you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you specifically about Dime and Five Minutes Alone is the guitar solo. Like Dime has so many iconic guitar solos, but there's something about the sound of that solo in Five Minutes Alone which just jumps out at me. Like, I don't even know what it is technically, but it's just, the sound of the guitar, I, I don't really recall any other Pantera song where I hear that sound. Do you guys remember recording the guitars for that particular song? Uh, were you in the room when he did that solo, Tim? I don't know. It was, was a probably... pretty it was a pretty simple solo. And at that point, Vinny was still recording all of Dime's uh, guitar parts and solos. Terry would do it sometimes, but mostly it would be Vinny. I remember... Dimes Tech, Grady Champion being there, and they were making sure that the tone was right because that it, the tone is unique on that song. And I can guarantee you it was, all right, dude, go out there and just fry this thing out. Hmm. And what he meant by that was he always talked about uh, fry being on the top of his his overall tone, and it's just that it's like a whole other realm of distortion, hmm. a whole other upper band of harmonic distortion on top of the distortion that he already has. And he called it fry. Okay. Go out there and put some extra fry on this. And so you could, and it, and his pick was probably not his standard, um, uh, nylon green, green Tortex pick that yeah. he used this is actually one of his picks that he used really i keep it in my studio so cool. uh it wasn't that standard one it was probably something else like a, a piece of metal like a metal guitar pick and it so it made along with the fry or the distortion pedal or whatever he had in front was like a very abrasive mm. little thing it's, your, it's that it's that normal yeah, yeah it, it he he was the master of doing things like that to make things be different to make things sound different hmm. and and that being said and then we probably had uh a i remember from the mix we had some kind of just like reverb on it as well hmm. so those two things culminating together uh were that's what made that sound and again like I was playing, I have the I have the multi tracks for Far Beyond Driven, and That's I was cool. playing them for a friend the other day, and they were amazed at how how close to the finished product that the multi tracks, multi -tracks are. sound. Mm. It's like the mix wasn't a whole lot of extra added stuff. It was this, That's you cool. know, and we we're like, yeah. That's how when 
when you were doing something and you were committing it to analog tape, it wasn't fix it in the mix. It was get it right to tape, get it right first. Then we'll mix it, you know, then we'll see what the mix brings out. And so, yeah, that was, I, I do remember there was probably something like that going on in the, in the control room that night because he approached each solo like its own little separate song. And if, that's really if cool. That makes yeah. That's sense. really interesting. Would he kind of improv his solos or would he write those out? There was a couple of times he improv the solo and we were like, you're keeping that. It was that first take is golden thing. Every now and then there would be one like that. I remember, I remember one on reinventing the steel like that. And we were like, do not touch that. And then he would come, uh, he would come back and just do like a little, a little bit of like, he wouldn't change the part. He would just execute a note or two better. Hmm. kind of thing and we'd be like do not touch that that is perfect we're not because we there was one night i remember in particular where it was just like hurry up we're gonna we're gonna be late for last call what we call last call every night you know hitting the bar Mm -hmm. and uh he was just like all right let me put a solo on this real quick so we can listen to it on the way to the bar and he whipped out this solo real quick and it was like that's staying on the album that's not going anywhere and we kept it uh note for notes uh that was on reaming still i don't remember which song and then there was another song on damage plan called moment of truth that is like a two and a half minute long solo that is all one take that's cool one take one first shot by the end of that solo when when he did that i've got a whole other story about that particular night Mm -hmm. but that is a one take solo uh but most of the time he would have his solos worked out before he came into the studio because he would have he, he, we had the studio there at Dime's house, the main studio. Hmm. And then he had his own little, what he called a four track studio upstairs okay. in his house. And he would sit up there and he, there somewhere there's a closet full of four track cassettes of him working out solos. That's really cool. Yeah. I had to go through a bunch of uh, stuff to find some multi tracks and uh, up in his closet, there's, there's literally a closet where there's there's boxes and boxes of cassettes and and you they're they're written on it says uh fucking hostile solo <laughs> that's solo awesome one, fucking hostile solo two sh- a shedding skin solo you know uh you know all all the stuff that he did and he would sit up there and construct these and work on them and then he would come in to record you know kind of kind of away from the whole the demo is going to end up being the album philosophy gotcha but but again he treated these solos like his his they were a song inside the song Hmm. you know they were all they were a lot of them were meticulously worked out and and he was looking for a certain thing some of them were only half worked out Hmm. and then he would sit there me and him would sit there for hours and go he'd go all right what if i hit this with this uh augmented riff okay what if i try it diminished what do you think of that uh, what if I pick this up legato? What if, and he was actually very musically. That's cool. A lot of people don't know this, but he was actually, I wouldn't say musically educated, but he was musically smart in that, in that regard. And I was going to add to that and also say extremely organized amongst the chaos. Hmm. Yes. Extremely organized amongst the chaos. So what might appear to be one person's, total you got to be freaking kidding me we're going about it this way totally would make sense when you broke it down uh exactly what sterling was just saying right there if you were to go back and take a look at some of the notes that were probably written Mm -hmm. uh cassettes that were done uh one of my pet pet things with dime was always he had that he had that camera going 24 <laughs> seven and it, it literally, you know, I'm sure there are things that, that were caught that would have never, that were captured that, that we would never think a second thought about, <laughs> but it's there. It, yeah. it, it, it's totally there. There there's absolute, in my humble opinion, uh, total genius amongst some, what might appear to be chaos going on. Yeah, That's really cool. and then some of it was chaos for the sake of chaos. All right, let's oh, yeah. do this. Let's plug in 10 foot pedals just to see what sound they'll make, and that's what we're going to roll with. Never to ever, ever be touched or du- reduplicated ever again, even if you tried. 
you know, stuff that I would never even thought of crazy recording scenarios, put a mic in the bathroom and then we're going to compress that. And then we're going to run it back through a guitar speaker and then mic that, you know, it's just crazy stuff, dude. And, and you stuff that I even took notes on that I could never even duplicate today if I mm. tried. So Dime had a very producer savvy mindset. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. Him and Vinny both. Dimes oh. came from more of a musical side and Vinny's came from more of a technical side. And, and the two of those coming together was what helped that happen. Which by the way, Daniel, and I'm sure that you probably know this, but that is very, very rare to get technical mm -hmm. and artist side uh, where they can actually speak the same lingo and actually know what's going on. That made such a big, big difference to oh. even those of us who were kind of, and I say this respectfully too, mm -hmm. but those of us who were on the outside kind of looking in on their bubble for that period of time. Yeah, that's really cool. So, I mean, you guys were talking a little bit earlier about the relationship between Dime and Vinny creatively. Was there any, was one of them more the leader than the other or were they kind of equal in that sense? Totally equal. Yeah. Totally yeah. equal. No one dominated e e each other. They worked as a, a very much symbiotically. Personality-wise, what were they like? Were they very similar or were they different? No. Different, yeah. No, they were two very different people. Vinny was, he was more like the business guy. He was more like the guy that for, for the longest time, he kind of held, held the whole thing together because he made sure everybody got paid. He made mm. sure that there was somebody to drive. They made sure that, you know, he took care of all the business stuff uh, he learned from his dad. And then as, as the years went by, Dime really started stepping into that role as well. But I would say Dime was more, uh, and, and not to say that Vinny wasn't a loose cannon, but Dime was more of a loose cannon in that respect. He was, he was a giant child. Uh, he was fun. He, he had that video camera rolling all the time. He was always looking to laugh. He was always the guy that lit up the room. Vinny was a little more, I'm not going to say reserved in that way, but Vinny was more of a kind of read the room mm. and Dime was more like be the room. Oh, you know, that's cool. Does that make that's sense? Very well put, Sterling. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, and it, it was wasn't out of a need to feel like he was the attention center. It no, was no, it was. he was, he was the room as it Sterling was, said. It was, I need, it wasn't, I need attention. Look at me, look at me. It was, and, and this is, is said with the most heartwarming kindness, uh, but it had to do with, uh, he wasn't on or off. It was just him. And he was, uh, whenever he met somebody, he made that person feel like they were the only person in the universe and he was completely focused on them. He wanted to make sure that they were happy and having fun and that we were here to rock and roll. And he made everyone feel like that, mm -hmm. not just a fan or me or Tim or whatever it was that he he truly was I think a, a very empathetic person and I think that he fed off of positive energy and 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 exuded that as well he would he could light up a room like nobody and still make you feel like you were the focus that you were you know he was there and he was talking to just you hmm. you know and that, I think he had that effect on so many people. Uh, my life, as I know it right now, wouldn't be what it is without him. Mm. And, and, and Vinny, too. There was a lot of shit that Vinny taught me. But without those two guys, my life wouldn't be what it is because they really helped me come out of my shell mm. and be more assertive. And, but, be, but be nice of, as I'm being assertive. You know, those kinds of qualities. And they were... Uh, in that respect, yeah, they were very different people, but they both taught me kind of a lot of the same things. That's awesome. Know? I really respect that. So I got, I'm curious, you know, during the um, during Damage Plan, was their relationship the same, or did I guess, for lack of a better word, the, the bitterness of how Pantera ended, did it affect them as people in any way? 
yeah, it affected all of us. We thought Pantera would live forever. Hmm. It was too big. It was too powerful. It was too good to, to be not only destroyed, but destroyed in that fashion so publicly. Hmm. And they, it was a huge betrayal of all of that brotherhood and, and the way that it happened. And what happened, what was going on with Damage Plan was that it, it originally started as just me and Dime in the studio, and it was going to be his solo album. Because when we got done with Reinventing the Steel tour cycle, we were in Japan and we said, uh, Philip was getting ready to make a down record because Philip made the demand that, hey, I'm not making another damn Pantera record until I make the next down record and I get to do something different because he was growing weary of Pantera. So not only did that happen, but Diamond Vinny were the ones that went to bat for Phil to get his record deal for down two. So they were the reason he got his deal with Electra. And so during that that space well dime was going to go do his thing musically and and that's what we started on that's what damage plan ended up being but as we got further through the process with damage plan and uh vinny started hearing some of the stuff we were doing and he was like man i can lay some drums on that that'll sound killer let's do this and and Vin, and Dime's only stipulation was, I don't want it to sound like a Pantera record. This is my record. And he was like, fine, but let's just go do it. And so we started all working together, me and Dime and Benny, on that, on those songs. And then as we came through, you know, the next month or two after we're still working on this stuff, here comes all this stuff on the internet of Phil and Rex talking trash about this whole thing. And we're literally sitting there looking at each other going, what is going on? What is happening? And that was, uh, that was the beginning of the end right there. And yeah, it changed them. And then at a certain point, they were like, we've got to move on. We've got to, with, we have to, there's no reconciliation here. We have to move forward. And, and yeah, they weren't real happy about going from playing arenas back down to playing clubs but that's what they did because they loved the music they wanted to keep making music and so they kept they just kept moving forward and that was going to be that was going to be the thing uh well we're not going to do pantera right now we're going to do damage plan Hmm. hell we didn't even have a name for it for the first 10 months that we were working on it we worked on it for over a year before we released it so yeah, it was a, it was an odd time, and it changed all of us, not just Diamond and Benny, but but me too, and and a bunch of dudes that were on the the original crew, and it just you know yeah, it changes a lot of shit. Were you there on tour with Damage Plan the night of Dimebag's death? I was not. I was mm-hmm. uh, home. Uh, I I was on that tour about six months before all that went down. I got to a point on the damage plan tour where my drinking had taken over and I didn't want to be there anymore. The beautiful thing about those guys was, Hey man, if, if you, if you need help or you need a break, take it. And that's essentially what happened. And I left the tour because I was not happy anymore. Me and the tour manager got into a fight and I was tired and just, beat down and so I went home yeah I was not there that night and had I been there who knows uh how my life would be right now Hmm. well I can almost tell you and and not to not to uh elongate this conversation about that but one of the things that I I got I remember when Sterling called me that night and I Hmm. remember very specifically where I was uh, and the mood went from, Hey, we're getting ready for, you know, the holiday season, so on and so forth to shit, man. It, it's almost like tunnel vision. The, the moment that Sterling got those words out of his mouth, it's like my whole world has now changed. Hmm. I'm not anywhere as close to, uh, to these guys as Sterling was, but I don't know if you remember this, Sterling, but one of the things that I said to you is, you know, I thank God above that you weren't there. Yeah, I remember. 
because I was pretty obliterated, but I remember. I think you might have been all up in that. Oh yeah, I most definitely would have the whole fight or flight thing. You yeah, know, what do you do when you're faced with that and no one knows until it's that time? So I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. And and you know, everybody says that I'm glad you weren't there and, and that but there's that survivor's guilt that, that mm. happens. Sure. You know? Lots sure. of lots of therapy later, I can tell you that that's just the way that was meant to be. You know? Yeah. It is what it is. That's nuts. When that happened, I mean, I guess Sterling, this would be a question for you. Was it a was it a guaranteed damage plan was done, or was that not even something people were thinking about at the time? I think it was a guarantee done. Hmm. Just like at that point, I think it was also a guarantee that Pantera was done. Hmm. Dime was the heart and soul of that whole both of those bands and with Vinny included they were the ones that that came up with all of that stuff and and without those two it never would have happened i'm not belittling rex or, or phil or their parts in any of this uh but yeah both those two bands were completely done when that happened and it and and i i i think that it basically put the cork in a very short and powerful legacy and also that it put put the end curly Q on, on, uh, this will never happen again mm-hmm. kind of thing. Any, any legitimate reincarnation further furthering of the, that yeah. any, any legitimacy to any of that, it will never happen again because wow. Yeah. There's, they, they only made one of those, man. They, mm-hmm. they made one dime and that was it. <laughs> yeah. Did Vinny ever recover fully from dimes death or did that never leave him? Never left him. Hmm. I don't think it's left any of us. Yeah. No, no, it changed all of us in different ways. But no, nah, he always, after that he yeah he went on to do hell yeah I was there for all of that, but and he got to go out and play and and have the joy of music back in his life after his brother died, which he thought he would never find again, but he did. That's but good. not like that, not on that level, uh, not and I don't mean financially or successfully, but just that bond that he had with his brother musically. Uh, but yeah, that he had a hole in his heart. Uh, he was, he was a diff, literally a different person after his brother died for the, whatever it was, the 13 years that, yeah. that he was still around. He was not the same person. Yeah. That's sad. But I mean, it yeah. goes to show how, how close they were and how important their, that relationship was. So they were, they were not twins, but they should have been twins. Obviously we know what happened. If that didn't happen, if Dimebag was still with us, was Damage Plan going to be a long-term band, or was there always the thought of reuniting with Pantera eventually? Knowing Dime and Vinny as people, I would say that Pantera would have eventually gotten together, and it would have been Dime that would have facilitated that. Hmm. Because Dime was the kind of person that didn't like holding on to that shit. And it would have eventually righted itself, I believe. Hmm. I, I agree with Sterling. Yeah. Sterling was much closer to all of that than I was when all of that started uh, going down. But just uh, once again, you know, I've, I've said this before, the character, um, a lot of folk think of, you know, uh, Pantera being this, this just angry or maybe aggressive, this or that. But the, the truth is, is the uh, just the I don't even know what the right word for this would be, but the the human element okay. mm-hmm. with these guys was just impeccable. They I, they, I, they could have been assholes, but they weren't. Right. Hmm. They weren't. Not ever. Not ever. That's and cool. I think it's fair to say, <laughs> to say Sterling and I, both we've encountered a few of those along the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Hell, I encountered some yesterday. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> it never ends. It never ends. Sorry, but, uh, man. No, nah, man, they were, they, I think Dime would have, would have totally righted that stuff. They had had, uh, you know, they're brothers. They fight. The bands fight. It's a marriage. It's a four or five way marriage, you know, and you, you're going to fight. You're going to argue. Even the best marriages need, need maintenance. Even the best 
relationships have rough moments, you know, and, and just multiply that times four. And that's, that's the dynamic you have in a, in a, a room full of dudes that are trying to create and have a common vision. Just that alone in and of itself is a, is a most difficult task mm. to get someone to share the same vision with another person. And if you get four people that share that same vision, even for a minute, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, on that note, I want to ask you guys, when it comes to like physically actually working with the band, you know, and just, I guess the creative energy in the group, you know, with a lot of bands, it's usually one or two guys that kind of run the show. With Pantera, what was it like? Was it like, let's say Dime would come up with most of the stuff or would it be Vinny or was it more like everyone kind of came together and had equal contributions from your experience? Well, my, my experience, because I've gotten to work with them by the time Far Beyond Driven got to me and Tim, it was already mostly recorded mm. except for some guitar overdubs and all the vocals, pretty much all the vocals. Okay. So what, what happened there at sound lab for the first, what month or two, maybe three was Philip would come down and do a few vocal sessions and then he would turn around and go right back home to new Orleans. And then, mm. you know, dime would do some guitar overdubs or added stuff or a lead or something like that because, uh, dr- drum parts were already done songs were already written and, all, and committed to tape but when i got to work with them after that tour and that that whole cycle after great southern trend kill was that you know i finally got to work with them in that fashion from the ground up as mm-hmm. a co-producer the way by then they Early on in, in their career, the only thing that they ever demoed uh, that was on the major label releases was Cowboys from Hell. There's demos for that. They're on that anniversary release. Hmm. Because of the problems that they ran into with that particular okay. uh, style of writing and recording was that some of the things that were on the demos didn't make it into the final product. And so, and, and some of the things in the demos had a little more fire, a little more electricity yeah. to them yeah. than, than some of the things that ended up on the album. Yes. The album sounds slicker. It's uh, it's bigger, it's badder, it's more ferocious sounding, but there are some performances that they would have loved to have carried over to the original album. So from that point on, they really adopted the whole philosophy of there will be no more demos. Hmm. What we start writing on in the studio will become the finished product. And so that being said, they started moving in different directions in the studio where they would hire a, uh, they would like whatever our tour sound company was at the point, that point in time, they would call them and have them deliver a monitor system down to the studio, like a stage Mm. monitor system with floor wedges and a mixing console and everything and they would track live with with each other in the room at the same time and that's where a lot of that bottled up that lightning in a bottle energy comes from especially from from guys like that and what what would happen would be dime would come down to the studio he'd have a riff and he'd be like, okay, yeah, that's cool. Uh, I think I know what to play over that. And they would play that until they felt like they got it right. They'd commit it, commit it to tape. And then they would stick a couple of different things together, see if it worked together, flowing from one part to mm-hmm. the other. But yeah, mostly it was dime. Uh, every now and then, uh, maybe Philip would come up with a riff on the on something. Wait if what if you went into from this part to something a little more or or whatever yeah know? and and yes it was a collaborative effort but the spark was always dime and, and Vinny. that was i mean they were the heart of that band they wrote all that music that's just the way that was um i wouldn't say they ran things they were all a it was a collective it was mm-hmm. a it was a quarter quarter each partnership there but uh, artistically it was always dime and benny that's so cool so i guess you know for the band did they in, would they, would it be fair to say then that they would write their songs in studio like they wouldn't really do much writing before going in or would they have some ideas prepared they would have they they would write most everything in the studio like i said dime would come down there were just pieces of things you know a riff mm-hmm. uh i've got this idea for this riff I, i've got this idea for this uh slow thing you know and then 
Rex would come up with a bass part or, uh, you know, and it would all kind of start gelling at that point. And, and then Philip would, would immediately start. He would take the music and go home and put lyrics to it hmm. kind of a thing, you know, and he would have, Philip would have a lot of specific ideas about the way things should go, go, go from this course into this bridge or this breakdown kind of thing. They would try different edits you know, we would we would throw something down to a half inch tape and then I would edit a, a you know, part from one part gotcha. to another, you know, again, no pro tools, you know, <laughs> we're talking razor blade and tape here. Yeah, uh, we uh, there would be uh, sometimes it would be different. Sometimes dime would be like I played this little thing to a drum machine. Uh, they didn't they didn't use sequences or, or clicks either. They, oh, cool. uh, they played off of one another. So uh, he would say, I wrote this to a drum machine, but I'll loosen it up a little here and you guys see what you think. And so, yeah, that's kind of really that, cool. that way, you know, that's amazing. Interesting man. to watch a song come together from nothing, you know, but that's how they did it. They wrote they were every, like everything on reinventing the steel was written right there in the studio. Hmm. Everything on damage plan written right there in the studio. That's cool. You mentioned that Dime would be the one that came up with most of the ideas and that people would build off of it, but would people always accept the idea or would like Rex and Phil say no sometimes? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, like I said, it's, it's, it wasn't the dime bag show hmm. or the Vinny show or the Phil show. Hmm. It was a collective effort and they all put in uh, good ideas and bad ideas. The bad ideas got chunked and the fat got trimmed and you ended up with a great song most of the time. But yeah, there's, I've seen them argue in the studio, you know, uh, I've seen them have a difference of opinion about things, but one thing's for sure is that when it came time to release that album, they were all happy with whatever we were releasing. They were a hundred percent on board. All of the fat had been tri uh, trimmed. I, everything, every, there wasn't it's some dude sulking in the corner at the end of it going, I really didn't like that idea. They were on board. They were they, that. And that's why they made such great music when they made it was because it was, it was all done in agreement. And, but yeah, to get to that point, sure. Yeah. There was, there was some tense moments. There were some, that's, that's not good enough. There was, well, I don't know what to do. Well, what do we do here? Uh, all right, well, let's, Let's put this off, you know, and, and a lot of this, a lot of that kind of stuff, like the tense moments and this isn't working here kind of things were solved by the fellowship hmm. of what was going on there. And it was solved by, well, let's go have a beer and come back to it. Or let's jam on some Van Halen real quick hmm. and, and see if that inspires us, you know, or yeah. whatever, you know, it was always something cool uh, that, it would always come around, you know, it wouldn't be like, well, the, you know, the whole Cartman thing on South Park, screw you guys, I'm going home. It wasn't like that at all, you know, it was, cool. but yeah, there, yeah. There was never any rigidity to the art. There was never any cookie cutter, anything. No. It, it was, no. you know, it I don't even know how to very explain organic. That very it's organic really process. organic and you never knew where something was going to come from yeah so you really need to be open-minded about stuff even at the level where and once again i say this super respectfully um at the level where sterling and i were as as the make this happen guys mm -hmm. um it it definitely before something was ever done it was always uh, at least talked about it. Are, are we sure that this is what we want to do? And Daniel, I'll say it like this because mm -hmm. Sterling's already mentioned this. This was pre digital recording uh, as we know it today. No Pro Tools. This was all analog tape. You better make damn good and sure that where you're about to punch in, that's where it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Because if that's incorrect, Number one, you're not going to get it back. And then number two, it might have been the performance of all performances. That's a really good point. So speaking of great Pantera performances, do you guys remember working on I'm Broken? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. What was that like? Yeah. Uh, maybe my favorite out of all of my Pantera songs. Hmm. Uh, I, for me personally, I think it's, it's because I've heard it so many times <laughs> hmm. and I, uh, 
gotten to the point to where I know what I feel like every little detail of that song, what it's all about. Here's what I can tell you, Daniel. Mm-hmm. By the time that we got to mixing, my my job was literally being the transport guy. So mm-hmm. when I say transport guy, my job was to roll us back to the top of the song, whatever we were working on. I had control over all of that. So I was the tape operator Okay, cool. <laughs> through all of that. Every day that I walked into that place, that was the song that I wanted to hear first. That's cool. Yeah, it was a great tune. I I just remember hearing it for the first time and going, whoa, that sounds kind of like, it really reminded me of uh, Mississippi Queen by Mountain. Oh, wow. I I just, yeah, I just made that connection now. Yeah, it it really hit me like that at at first. But then the the groove is just so infectious on that song, man. And, And just the way that it was done and then Phil putting vocals on it, getting to hear it as without the vocals first and then when phil came in and did vocals it was like shit that took it to a whole new level and just yeah just the way it it metamorphosized into something you know the caterpillar turning into the butterfly that you get to witness in the studio a lot of times it's just it was one of those things where it's it's ingrained in me that riff that yeah well i mean now that you said it it does now that you said it, it does kind of strike me as like Mississippi Queen on steroids. Like it, 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 especially that last part. Da-da-da. You know, just that whole thing. And just, yeah, I, I had such a great time on that song. I couldn't really say anything specific about it other than I just, it's one of my favorite Pantera songs of all time, you know, mm-hmm. definitely. Do you know if Mississippi Queen was actually the influence for that musically? Mm-mm. I don't think so. No, they kind of came up with that. Out of the blue, just like kind of when you think about it, that's kind of a southern rock riff. It's very southern. It's very bluesy. I mean, just really seemed to nail. I, I can tell you for a fact that you may not hear it. You, you may hear whatever when you listen to some of their stuff. But if you go back and really put it under the microscope, you're going to hear ZZ Top. You're going to hear uh, Charlie Daniels. You're going to hear David Allen Coe. You're going to hear all of this country and blues type stuff that mm. that you would never thought would would be part of a heavy that extreme of a heavy metal band you're going to hear just really really bluesy stuff simple riffs that turn into a monster thing you know mm. dime had a way of chaining all that stuff together that i still wish i had more insight into what his process was but i think it was just tapped into the universe tapped into something you know, one of the things that I think is really cool about that song is when it comes to Phil's vocals in the verses, it's like he's kind of talking and answering himself. You know what I mean? Yes. When you guys were making that in the studio, was that like, because, you know, as you guys are saying, Dime and Vinny would come up with the music, then Phil would add that in. Was that initial, you know, if that was immediately his response to kind of have that give and take, or did that kind of develop with time? I think that developed with time. And I'm going to elaborate just a little bit more on that. If you were to take a look at the multi-tracks to, today, uh, it also came down to the uh, the ability where we where can we put all of these vocals. So you've got a vocal, you've got an answer vocal, and Daniel, here's what I'm going to tell you is that mm-hmm. uh, when you're when you're dealing with 24 tracks of analog tape and you've got limited tracks, you're going to be looking for space to put stuff where uh, in, in, in your mind's eye, you're going, that doesn't belong on this track. Hmm. And that was a part of, that was a part of our job as well, was to figure out uh, track sheets, where a vocal could go, where an answer vocal could go. And in a lot of cases, even the vocals are stacked to a certain point. Hmm. You may not know that listening to it, but if you break it down, you're going to see that it's not one vocal, but it may be two tracks of vocals, in some cases, three tracks of vocals to give you a harmonic uh, development of that vocal, what's going on with all that stuff. Here's my point, yeah. is that we were limited to tracks, and so in some cases, it was like, there may be a guitar solo in one area of the song on this track, and then the next thing you know, you've got a vocal popping up right there. Hmm. And so that made for a very unique mixing um, mixing style, if you will. Hmm. Uh, I'll just say it like this, uh, and I think Sterling concur, can concur with this, 
is we uh, we had to keep notes of over our notes as to where shit was patched what into, track, in, what in, track into was the cross patched to what input on the console blah 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 it's it's yeah it's very it can get very convoluted very fast but if you have two people on the same page it makes sense and to kind of speak into that we even turned that into a game if you want to think of it like that okay. and so what i'm talking about there is we came up with uh we just went to you know local uh nickel and dime store and bought us uh what is it what is that board called sterling poster, board. poster board poster board yeah right. and so we had duties for every person involved with the project and so it might be 10 songs 10 or 11 songs so you would have all of those songs <clears throat> lined up and then you know was there a solo on this song yes there was okay well has that solo been done if so that person gets a sticker maybe they get a gold star for the day or they or they just draw a little picture in the square you know, yeah whatever just to indicate that it's done so yeah you get you get lost in a project that big and you go well did we do that or not well huh. look at the chart you know that's smart a general question for Phil. I remember, Tim, last time you and I spoke, you said something that, like, to this day, it's been stuck in my head. And I've been, like, trying to think, how does this work? Because it was just so cool. You, I remember you told me that when Phil would do his screams and he would sing, he would actually not be stressing out his voice. And, like, Terry Dade had a way to do it where, like, he'd be kind of close to the mic and was just using a technique. Um, do you know, I mean, if you'd be able to elaborate, like, how do you get a, a scream that powerful without actually exerting yourself? Do you know how he did it? Well... Shy, any anything shy of just sheer talent and him knowing how to how to go about doing that would be you know it would just bastardize the the art form of, of which Phil uh, brought to the table. Hmm. But with the understanding and Sterling, just so that you're up to speed with basically what I said, I you know a lot of people think that maybe Phil was standing behind a a super expensive microphone screaming his guts out. And the truth is, is that it was a really <laughs> very inexpensive microphone in the control room, doors closed. And I, I never was really privy to, uh, you know, how loud those vocals were. And I can guarantee you, it wasn't screaming at the top of his lungs. It had everything to do with the technique. The simple fact that, uh, you know, he's got an SM58 on his vocal, really close mic, proximity effect, and there's all kinds of really cool shit that you can do when when you're that close and intimate to, to a microphone. But for me to sit here and try to tell you, oh, I've got, you know, I've got this really grand idea of how Phil went about doing all of that mm. would be a lie. It's simply, here's what I can tell you, okay. is that it, it's not exactly what we all think that it was hmm. it was a sm58 with really good control coming from phil and if if i could you know elaborate on that with a master master producer going let's do it this way hmm. we're going to turn the speakers down we're going to close the door we're going to lock out the rest of the world and we're going to nail this down and I could be wrong about this, but these vocals didn't take that long to do. It wasn't like we were there, you know, Daniel, I've done lots of pop projects and stuff like that, where it takes freaking months to get vocals to the point to where the producer's happy with, with what's going on. And this didn't take long to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I contribute that to, again, an individual who really has a, just an incredible, uh, amount of vocal control knew exactly what he was going for and then to take someone like a terry date and go all right we're going to make this become a reality you know and I, I i tell my students this very same thing how do you get this scream thing i think i mentioned to you know there's different yeah. breathing techniques and all this kind of good stuff i was never i never really ever 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 thought about stuff like that but it took a little bit of some educating, you know, from vocalists who do this all the time. Some do it better than others. And, uh, and I'll just say, you know, in my humble opinion, Phil was one of the best ones who had mastered 
a technique that hmm. really worked for the band. I can second uh, that for sure. It is a technique that he he knows what he's capable of and what his body does, and I think mm -hmm. that that's speaks uh, to him being zoned in on that. Uh, and yeah, it's a fifty-eight uh, in a control room, no headphones, speakers. Uh, sometimes they're up, sometimes they're not. It depends on what he needs to feel the music. Um, just I know this just from having to record his vocals uh, a few times. It's always been a 58 proximity effect, as close as you can get, and he's working it and doing some things, and, you know, it's all a lot of different techniques going down yeah. there. A lot, lot of, lot of, not a whole lot of compression, thing. not a whole lot of EQ, hmm. just kind of letting it come in flat, you know, My area. and then putting a little polish on it later. So, like, if I ask then, I mean, because um, from – whether it's Far Beyond Driven or Southern Trend Kill or Reinventing, did his approach change or was he consistently doing the vocals the same way? Very consistent. Very consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, even all the way up through Reinventing, the steel still, still stayed the same. It was me and Dime uh, recording his vocals on Reinventing the Steel. And it was, you know, we had... We had a setup for him where it was a 58 going through uh, a distressor in the uh, very minimal EQ, just taking out some low mids uh, and letting the rest just be what it is, go, mm. go to tape with that. And then we had another mic set up where there was headphones and he could go out and if it was like something he needed, he felt that he needed a, a condenser mic for, we would have that ready for him, but that would be just like a few different things here and there. But he always came in to the studio he was absolutely 100 percent prepared had his vision for what he wanted to do had you know dime would just have me set up and go all right i want you to have four tracks or six tracks ready to go for him and and because it moved fast it moved real fast with philip and mm. so you had to capture everything and you go all right i want to double this phrase i'm going to do a harmony to this phrase i'm going to sing uh, this line into the nice mic, blah, 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 blah. And then Interesting. it was, I mean, it was structured before he even walked in there. So he, he was always very prepared at it, had his notes. That's really shit interesting. And would he be the kind of guy who like, uh, like for example, I spoke with Mike Frazier recently and he said that when he would record ACDC, Brian Johnson would physically hold the microphone. And yeah. um, another guy I spoke to said that uh, Perry Farrell would, run around the studio recording vocals. Was there anything like eccentric or different that Phil did that stuck out? Nah, nah, very straightforward. That's cool. Very straightforward. Uh, he would hold the, the 58, hmm. you know. I've had people record before that are eccentric. They need to be in the dark. They need to have it, you know, this little red lamp over this or whatever. You know, I have to have my little workstation here or I want to be all the way in the booth far away. I don't want to wait by you to see me. Uh, but the, most of them are pretty straight ahead, pretty straightforward. But yeah, I've, had, I've got some weird stories, but they don't they don't have Phil in them. <laughs> He's pretty straight ahead. <laughs> hey, fair enough. We were talking about how Dime, you guys would record twice to kind of get that double. Would it be the mm -hmm. same thing with Phil? Would you guys double his vocals? Not all, not all, but some. Like if he's emphasizing a phrase or a word, then yes, we would double things up, uh, but not most of the time with him if it's just a verse vocal that it was a single thing you know mm -hmm. it was a single vocal uh if we're looking to get that effect then yeah he'd pop a double on there and he might do a low part to it to kind of thicken it up but yeah most of the time it's just a single vocal that's awesome so i want to ask you one thing about vinnie paul in particular you know i mean you guys have talked at length about you know how cool of a dude he was and what he was just in general like to be around um as a musician specifically what was he like to work with as a drummer was there anything unique about his approach like how would he work in studio from your experience with him he played with other musicians he that's how he tracked and so when him and dime would track drums or whatever either Rex would be involved or it would just be Diamond Vinny and they would play off of one another as if they were playing live together. Then Dime, you know, then we'd get the drums uh, tightened up if we needed to do any small edits. Gotcha. But for the most part, 
that dude was a human metronome. That's and what I mean when I say human metronome, a metronome is that perfect timekeeping device. He was the human part of it, and he could do both very well and swing and flow and move mm -hmm. with whatever the song needed. If there was something that needed to happen edit-wise, it was usually very, very ev evident. There, It was like, oh, we need to tighten that up right there. That's a little bit late. And and uh, but there was no there was no click track there was no sequence there was no none of that silliness uh, with those guys and as a drummer he was just he would try if if he missed something we would go back and try to do it again we would either punch it in uh, recording wise or we would uh, edit it in later with another chunk of tape but that was very rare but. That's how, how also how we would piece songs together. They would play a section, and then they would go, okay, that feels pretty good. Now let's try to get to this other section. Let's trans this do this transition. Bam, I would punch it in, or we would slice tape uh, or do the digital edit on the radar. And once that came along, I think his task as a producer kind of lightened up Vinny's task hmm. as a producer, and then he could go back to just being a drummer, and that all kind of fell on me as far as the editing goes. Very few edits. The The dude was amazing, he, and he had a very specific sound. Hmm. Once you started EQing things and placing mics in a certain manner, you could, and he would play, it would be like, yeah, that's Vinny. That's cool. You know, it, but yeah, he was very easy to work with. Very, and again, another one of those guys had it mapped out, had it kind of ready to go in his mind as to, I think I know what I'm going to play here. Let me do this. He would very rarely up against one of the dimes riffs go, let me try this variation of this 20 different times. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was n almost never would happen, you know, because he usually had a really good idea, a sense of a song as a whole and not just the drum part. That's really cool. You know, he, had, he, he always had his ear and mind on the song as a whole. So you've mentioned before that Vinny and Dime were funny guys. Are there any funny experiences you guys had with the Abbott brothers that stick out to you in particular? So sure. Sterling, I want you to tell the story, if you don't mind, because you do it so well. <laughs> but I want you to tell the story about uh, Lingo and me misunderstanding what was being said. <laughs> right. And, you know, how all of that kind of came together. All right. Well... As most people know from watching some of the home videos, Dime was a very unique character. And, well, he kind of had his own language. He had his own way of speaking and ex expressing himself. And he had a lot of code words and uh, nicknames for things that aren't normal English 101 nomenclature okay. kind of stuff, you know, the, the, the Queen's English, so to speak. And... Uh, uh, he brought in a, a Roland 201 Space Echo uh, tape echo unit one day, uh, which is a very sought after, uh, unique sounding piece of gear. Nothing else on earth sounds like this thing. Okay. And it's a delay unit that uses a loop of tape instead of electronic, uh, you know, components okay. like they do now, like a guitar foot pedal. But yeah, it's a guitar effects unit. You plug into it and it gives you an, a, a delay or an echo. And uh, he goes, all right, man, we're going to go eat. You you and Tim uh, clean this thing up. Uh, we'll be back. We're going to use it. And uh, so we were like, okay, let's <laughs> go clean it up. So me and Tim went into the control room, and we got our alcohol, and we're going to literally get inside the thing and get to the tape mechanisms and the loot cartridge that's in there and clean it up. Now, by the way, when he says alcohol, we're talking rubbing alcohol to rubbing clean alcohol. the tape heads. Oh, okay, gotcha. Rubbing alcohol. Clean alcohol. the tape heads on the, on the looper. Okay? Gotcha. Yeah. All right. The, the, the rubbing, rubbing alcohol. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we get in there, and he Tim takes this cartridge apart with a screwdriver because it's the only cartridge we have. And, and he takes the loop out, and he measures it, and he puts a brand-new piece of tape the exact same length inside the cartridge. And we clean the tape heads and the rollers and all the stuff that's in this little machine. And uh, they come back from dinner and we're they're ready to use this thing. And Dime's like, all right, did you get that thing cleaned up, ready to go? 
And we're like, yeah, and we're all proud and beaming and happy that, yeah, we did exactly what you said. And, and so he's like, what's this? Cause the tape loop and the alcohol and the cotton swabs and everything oh, were laying on the table right beside it. And he said, well, that's the old tape loop. And that's the dirty, the dirty Q-tips and, and from cleaning the machine up, like you said, and he goes, oh no, man. I meant like take it in there and just hook it up and make sure it works. <laughs> I didn't want you to clean it because some of that dirt might make something sound really cool. And so that was our first lesson in what we affectionately titled Dime Bonics. <laughs> Dime Bonics. He had a he literally had a, a code word for everything. That's and, funny. Uh, and so it took it took us about a month of just hanging out with him to learn his what he spoke what his what the words meant and some of them were inside jokes some of them were like oh i could see that and and kind of practical and logical but most of it was like inside jokes like a if you were to lift something and take it to the next room he would call that hey man will you andrew that for me will you andrew that will you andrew that oh, okay. so like if you were to take his guitar take take the will you andrew that guitar for me i mean it's carry it into the other room or, or take, pick it up and actually haul it with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Because one of the guys that was the helper, his name was Andrew, and that's what he did. He went around Andrewing things. Oh, okay. And taking care of things and grabbing luggage and things like this. And so that, you know, just to give you an example of a, of a dime bonic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, clean this up meant, hey, man, take this situation and make it clean, make it work. You know, make, hook make it, it up all and, ready to go. Yes. And get it ready to go. Clean this up, you know, go or, or go, Hey, Hey, go blow this up. He means like take a picture or record <laughs> it, you know, just, and so, yeah, that was our first lesson in dime bonics was, was clean this up. So here's the real question. Did you guys actually have to blow something up for him? Uh, we had some fun with some fireworks <laughs> every now and then in the warehouse or a brick or two, uh, throwing it through a TV screen, but you know, uh, yeah, we were always blowing shit up. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, when, when it came to this, when it came to dime bags language, the thing is, did it evolve with time? Like, did new words oh, yeah. added in? Yeah, even even before he died, there were new words that would make their way into the little dictionary in our heads. Hmm. You know, so yeah, it, it was always evolving. Always, it didn't evolve so much as we still used all those other terms, but it would they would just get added to. You know, like the Oxford Dictionary adds a couple of words every year, you know, a couple of new words like streaming or whatever. Yeah, I hear you. But would the old words change meaning or would they always stay the same? No, no, the same. Always stay the same. Okay, always cool. stay the same. And yeah. so there was this language that just developed. <laughs> and it was an inside, it was an inside thing. You know, if you were part of it, you knew what it meant. And if you didn't, you, you were s on the side going, what are they talking about? You know? So it was our, our little our little secret, I guess, our little fun inside jokes. That's hilarious. And, you know, and, and everybody had their uh, uh, had their names. Oh yeah, <laughs> mine mine was Timmy Tooth. Yep, um, that was the first one you got hit with. I had many. I had I ended up with like twenty nicknames. Oh wow. Yeah, I used to get asked, "What exactly does Timmy Tooth mean?" And there were two versions to all of that. Oh yeah, so, right. 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 There was yeah, a, there was know, some duality to just about everything in that camp. That's Absolutely. Funny. You know, a little discretion, you know, in case <laughs> we got kids around. Well, Timmy Tooth, Timmy Tooth was a was a cartoon character that, you know, he carried around a toothbrush and he brushed his teeth. But we knew what Timmy Tooth really yeah. was. Hmm. The whole black tooth thing. So. The whole black tooth thing. So literally for, you know, for about what was it, seven months? Mm -hmm. Six I was months. The guy who wore the black tooth. That's cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was just, it was one of those things to where uh, you either get on board with it or yeah, you're going to be left in the dust. So I got a general question for both you guys. I mean, I know you didn't work on this record, but having spent all this time with the band, did they ever talk to you about what it was like making Vulgar, in particular making Walk? They would tell me stories from the studio because that one was, the first one was recorded at their dad's studio in Pantigo, and then they went and upstate new york and mixed it at some place called the carriage house then that one vulgar the next one was completely recorded and 
written, recorded, and mixed right there at their dad's studio in, in Pantigo. That's cool. I didn't have a lot to do at all with Vulgar, but one of my favorite albums of all time. It's it's still used as a measuring stick, and 100%. it's 30 years old. Yeah. And I think the cover story is hilarious. That is, they literally actually punched the guy in the face just repeatedly until they, <laughs> until the, they got the, the photographer. Album. Yeah, the photographer <laughs> did, did it, and yeah, he. Uh, what they pay that guy? Twenty bucks or something like that? It was like no, it was like fifty bucks a punch, and they think they punched him a total of five times. Is the story? The real story. It's not bad. It's not bad. Oh so, yeah. Two hundred fifty bucks. Wow. That's hilarious, dude. Oh, man. But yeah, I mean, just what go... does immortality cost? It costs $250. And a black guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, That's hilarious. So the next record after Vulgar, of course, was Far Beyond Driven. The two biggest songs on Far Beyond Driven, of course, are Five Minutes Alone and I'm Broken. Aside from those two tracks, is there any one song on that album that really sticks out to either of you? I really love Throws of Rejection, the last song before Planet Caravan. Hmm. Uh, that's probably my favorite solo on the album. And then I really love Shedding Skin because the first thing that Dime ever recorded, the first thing they ever worked on was the clean guitar part on Shedding Skin. What about you, Tim? I have to I have to double that. Again, we were really pretty much connected at the hip through throughout a lot of that. And I do distinctly remember several discussions uh, one of the songs that sticks out in my mind, uh, not necessarily being one of my favorites, but one of the creepiest to Vinny, I go, this song scares the shit out of me, man. He goes, well, it should. <laughs> and, uh, I, I won't say what he, what he said after that, but, uh, good friends in a bottle, bottle of pills was, okay. uh, one of the ones that sticks out in my mind and not necessarily because it's my favorite song, but it left this, like this really haunting uh impression on me and it stuck with me throughout pretty much throughout the you know the months that we were together with all of that mm -hmm. and uh, one might say well you know what was so unique about that that just left the impression and quite honestly i i, I think it had everything to do with the lyric content and me you know uh, kind of thinking through all of that and it's like goodness gracious uh, I never in my wildest dreams would ever imagine myself ever being in a position like that, but <laughs> that is kind of shit happens to people. <laughs> it does. It does. In general, what's like the trippiest song for you guys when it comes to the band? I really always have loved Tens. That's a great one, and, yeah. I mean, that song is just so flipping heavy and floods. Yeah. Uh, even though I didn't have a lot to do with with those, the production of the the Trinkill album that is that is like some of my favorite music that they ever did. So, in terms of the production on Great Southern Trinkill, do you know why the band chose to record that album in such dark tuning? Hmm, I don't know. That was the last record they did with Terry, and I don't know. I want to say that they. Here we are coming off of Far Beyond Driven, which was not all the same tuning. They had some, they had a couple of tunes that were standard tuning for them. And then they had a couple of songs that were like a, like a drop C type tuning, which C sharp, which was things like five minutes alone. I'm mm. trying, I'm just trying to think back to some of my tuning charts uh, from touring because I was Rex's tech. I, I don't know that there's an exact answer for that, honestly, because they they were they were experimenting with lower and different tunings, uh, as because the whole the whole Cowboys album is almost a four forty, just standard tuning. There, I think there's one or two songs on that album that are a drop D. Then they get into Vulgar and they started they started going into this uh, this C sharp tuning. It was a standard tuning setup. Uh, interval wise but the way tunings work uh it it is a thing that guitar players especially explore and uh new tunings inspire new riffs or pieces of music uh especially in the heavy metal thing which led to that whole subgenre called gent no. and, <laughs> and so i think you know what i'm talking about yeah, yeah. And, and so uh 
that in turn every every album that they did there's more of that there and trend kill they really got low they started using really big mm -hmm. gauge e strings and uh we're going down to like a sharp i think i mean that's, that's really nice. flipping low on on uh on war nerve and sandblasted skin those are like drop a sharp mm. and so that whole album really went because the tunings were going lower and lower that those tunings inspired heavier riffs they inspired heavier music, darker music. Mm -hmm. And I just think that one was a product of the other kind of thing. One thing fed the other, so mm. to speak. But mm -hmm. I, I wasn't in the room for a lot of that because if you were to ever see their studio when it was here, it's not, it's no longer a place. Mm. Uh, but when it was built out and it was a place, the, the control room was very tiny. Mm. It was just a small building and it was it was a very tiny control room and the the outside room where they tracked drums and everything was an open room and they would put guitar amps and bass amps in there it was all one big open space and there wasn't really any you know you couldn't fit a bunch of people in there so i wasn't there a lot for that one i was up in the house tuning guitars and and, and teching basses and stuff so uh it was terry date and ulrich wild at that point mm. uh doing the recording and the producing on that album so i wasn't there for a whole lot of it i did do a little bit of guitar recording with dime when terry and, and ulrich weren't available mm -hmm. but you know as far as the philosophy of that goes that's my take on it uh and and that's where they were headed with it dime was always looking for something new that's so cool. Want to ever... go heavier, want to go heavier, want to go darker, you know. Yeah. Did you work on Floods by any chance? Uh, no, I didn't. That was, again, that was uh, Terry Date. Hey, no worries. Boy. So then just a general question, because if you look at the chronology of Pantera's records, I mean, the first four records, it was always two years in between. And then there's this four-year gap between Southern Trend Kill and Reinventing. Uh, is there any particular reason why the band took extra time or like it was did it just happen that way? Well, the live record happened in between. So they were touring that that recording that was mixed from McAllen, Texas was on the Great Southern Trend Kill tour. Hmm. We we literally mixed that album while they were in the middle of Ozfest. Hmm. So we we they came home on a break from Trend Kill re recording all the Trend Kill stuff around the world. And we went through all of those shows and tapes and stuff. And we found kind of a, a pattern, if you will, that this Texas run that they did on the Great Southern Trend Kill Tour was just awesome. Hmm. They were just, they were hitting on all cylinders. We grabbed this one particular show from McAllen, Texas. That was the best of all of them. We said, we're going to mix this one. And then they went back out on the OzFest. They came back home. We mixed that album while they were on that break and then i went back out with them uh to go master the album in new york and then we went back out on the Ozfest. they dropped the the live album as a as a release hmm. and then we started the tour cycle for the live album immediately <clears throat> so they didn't ever stop touring or making music in the studio it went from one thing to the other very quickly and so the the a lot of people overlook that that well here here's the gap but we were making music and and touring we were touring for the live album yeah i know it sounds funny i was gonna say but, yeah i've never heard that before we're like like uh, yeah when you know, you put mean? it into perspective chronologically <laughs> yeah they did the the trend kill tour mm -hmm. then we did the live album we recorded and mixed two brand new songs for the live album mm -hmm. Then we put that out and immediately went back out on tour for the live album. Then we went back and did Reinventing the Steel. Mm -hmm. And so I got one question about Reinventing the Steel. It ended mm -hmm. up turning out to be Pantera's last record, obviously. Was there mm -hmm. any sense that that could be the case when you were working on it, or did that surprise you guys? It, it, it hit us out of the out of the blue. No, we, had, we didn't have a clue. We always thought, hey, we'll come back and do another Pantera record. Mm -hmm. But other, other things happened. Drugs happened. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, weren't drugs part of the story throughout the throughout it? Like, did it get much worse by the end? Is Was that the, the main thing? Um, I would say 
it was a common theme, not so much with Diamond Vinny, but with the other members of the camp. Uh, yeah, I would say that was common theme throughout things. Uh, alcohol most definitely <laughs> for sure was a, I mean, that was breakfast, lunch, and dinner for some of us, you know, that's that, but yeah, it was, it was the whole lifestyle and uh we used to have a saying uh drink it or wear it you know <laughs> it was you know it dude you're the, the one of the reasons like tim was talking about earlier about them going to bat for us when terry was saying well i'm not sure i need these guys was because we could keep up with them gotcha <laughs> we could be mentally on the same page as them and not flinch <laughs> And so I think that was part of it too. And, and if, if you could do that, they not, co not calling that any kind of a, a great accomplishment or, or a great badge of honor, but it was something that, Hey, this dude can keep up with us and still do his job. We need to bring him on board. And I think that's how they looked at it. They all, it was a nightly thing. You know, we, we had to drink just as much as the band did and be on the same page. They wanted, that's how we got close as we did. They wanted us on the same page hmm. mentally. It definitely was all for one, one for all. I mean, we, I had it expressed to me, look, you're, you're going to go. And I think I mentioned this to you as well, Daniel, you know, uh, earlier, was that uh, it didn't matter whether we were going to go see another band perform somewhere or if we were going to just go have dinner in some cases. We did that as a collective group. It mm -hmm. was never, you know, it was never, uh, you know, Dime is going to go have dinner by himself and Vinnie Paul is going to go have dinner by himself or with his friends. Everything together. Everything was together. We did. We would go when I would go on tour with them and we would be on tour with each other for three months in Europe and be miserable and want to come home. And we'd be all at each other's throats. Like you do when you live with somebody in a bus for a months on end. And then we would literally come home, fly home from Europe and be like, I need a break, blah, 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 blah. And it wouldn't, no, it wouldn't be like that. It would be like, all right. Uh, we're uh we're gonna head home get your drinking shoes on we're gonna go we did everything together for years that's awesome on end and it was yeah it wasn't i hate you i hate you you know it was never like that that's yeah. so cool man uh, it, it 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 literally was a brotherhood if you want to think of yeah. it as that that's awesome it really, really really was it it uh you know not to be sentimental or anything but i think that that changed my life. That right there, when I said, you know, that record changed my life, I think that was a part of what changed it for me was because I was really used to being, you know, the hired gun that was coming in. I was hired to make records. That That's what Sterling and I did. Mm -hmm. But with them, it's like, no, you're going to be a part. If you don't want to be a part of that, no foul, no harm, but you're not going to be here with us. If you don't want to participate, there's – there's no room for you to be here. Yep. And so we learned very quickly. And I, I, you know, quite honestly, certainly I never really thought of it that way, but I think, I think there's some uh, great truth in the, in the fact that maybe, maybe the fellows kind of looked at Sterling and me and, and saw that we were willing to go the distance every day, including, you know, keeping up with them, whatever that meant. On some cases it was like, I need Sterling, I need, for you to run to the grocery store and go get us some groceries. Yeah. That's cool, man. And Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Lovingly. Hey, send me, let's go. Let's, let's go do this. We got, we got stuff to do. So Sterling, do you remember working on revolution is my name? Oh boy. Do I, what was that like for you, man? Uh, it was great. It was, uh, it, it required a lot of work. I remember it being a very long drawn out process. This is when we started jumping off in, away from two inch tape and back into uh, a digital format. Mm. Uh, it's this actual machine right here, the very one. Really? Uh, an Otari radar, yeah. Mm. Uh, that, that very machine right there was the one that did uh, Revolution Is My Name. And uh, we would 
that whole i mean we worked on that song a lot there was a lot of they were they were kind of getting off into some territory where they that for that whole album they were very uh adamant that they wanted to make it kind of not retro sounding i think is the wrong word but Hmm. but uh they wanted to make a nod to the forefathers you know the black sabbath you know everybody you know all all of their influences and they were they were really tipping their hats in that direction and so revolution is my name is about that it's about it's about some of that stuff that they that they were influenced by and uh that song just the intro i remember me and dime working on that intro piece where he's doing all of those pinch harmonics and Mm. it's going up and down and we've got that timpani sounding drum in there and a kettle drum and and it's just this huge epic bunch of of stuff going on and i remember me and dime working on that for a couple of weeks really just to get all of those guitars to sync up just right and double up just right because at the end of the day, you, the reason that, that so much work was put into these things, uh, guitar-wise, was because it had to be meticulous. Because he was the one guitar player in in the band, he was the guy, but he wanted it to be massive, and so hmm. he didn't want it to sound like a two guitar player gotcha. band where there's kind of a looseness there. He wanted it to be as tight as possible. It feels like it's one performance, you know, as as tight doubled as tightly as possible if that makes any sense so a lot of his parts were meticulously crafted uh in a way that uh, that they it sounds like one guy you know so Mm -hmm. yeah which by the way you know if i if you guys will allow me to kind of step in that's how far beyond driven was as well yes Mm. I mean, I still have guys to this day when we break it down to listen to the multi tracks, they go, Oh my, I had no idea. Yeah. I yeah. had no idea that so this is tight. more than one guitar part. Mm-hmm. They're that, they are that solid hmm. with one another. Whereas usually when somebody goes back and stacks something in the recording studio, it's a little loose. You can hear it give and take. But with Dime, it was. Mm, it was just tight, watertight. So, cool. so if I may ask then, I mean, this might not make sense technically. Wouldn't it have just been easier to just like double his guitar, to just like duplicate it or no? You, nothing sounds like that. And Tim will reverberate this uh, to use another sound uh, word, but uh, <laughs> you cannot duplicate that yet. Uh, there's a, been a lot of attempts, but you just can't do it. Nothing sounds like an actual double of something. When you when you do the same performance twice and then stack it, it is nothing sounds like that. Nothing makes that those harmonics act like that. Nothing makes that effect happen other than actually physically doing it twice. Hmm. And you got to think about it like this as well, Daniel. This is this is my two cents worth sure you find perfection within the imperfections yeah so it's basically ding. like an artist <laughs> it, ding, who, ding, ding. we did a thing on the on on the guy who actually uh uh makes the grammy awards he says you know the american indians they used to leave a stitch undone in the in the uh art that they they made if it was a weaving or something of that nature they would leave a stitch undone and the reason for that is is because um, you know, if it were perfect, it would not be of this world. Mm. And I, I, I found that to be just like, just revel, just revolutionary to me. When I heard that, it's like, that's the art right there is recognizing that imperfection is perfection. It's the, it's the, some people call them mistakes. My, it's, my, it's my the wife, humanity. she's an artist. It's the humanity. Goes, oh, I made a mistake here. And I go, no, 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 no. That is, you know, that is character. Yes. And the one thing that I can definitely say about Far Beyond Driven being the one record that I got to, you know, participate with, with Pantera, mm-hmm. uh, this Pantera, the Far Beyond Dr- Driven record is, uh, in, in my mind, Sterling, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of uh, where you know the 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 marriage, if you will, uh, even between Sterling and I. That is where that all took place. That is where Sterling and I grew up. 
that's where we we gained our our metal wings if you will hmm. we had worked on metal records before and, and not to belittle any of those records because the groups that we got to work on very different mm -hmm. uh extremely precise with everything that was going on these guys i love them to this day they're very very good but it was the it was this project that uh sterling's already said it it changed my life yeah it, it literally changed my life because at that point in time once again we were talking about perfection imperfections doubling so on and so forth that's where i learned that it's okay to be a human being mm -hmm. and you're gonna make a mistake but that's okay that's okay we're gonna we're don't gonna be, at least we're don't doing be too something. hasty to to get rid of that mistake Ooh, you just pointed out something really, really cool. So I got this really cool talk to by Terry Date. Mm -hmm. And certainly you're going to remember this because at one point, once again, I was asked to go, go through the project or go through a song. And basically the comment was, I need for you to go through and clean up noise. I need for you to take some noises out of this song. Okay. So quite honestly i mean if you're talking about analog tape and you're talking about cleaning up noise you're talking about find where it is and then literally go into record and erase that noise unlike pro tools today where it's like oh we got a noise right there we'll just kind of snip that out and then we'll mute it or do whatever that wasn't really a part of the game plan hmm. my point being is that i learned the difference between good noise and bad noise. Gotcha. What's the difference? That's in the eye of the beholder. And that, in my humble opinion, is the difference between a uh, an artist who goes, ooh, that noise right there, keep it. Why? Why do we want to keep that? Because it's that is one of those, that is one of those unique characters that only exist in this song. Right. And so I learned so much. Uh, uh, through all of that, but this was a life changing experience for seven months. I got to, I got to look in on someone else's professional world that taught me to not be so, as Sterling said, not be so, uh, uh, inclined to just go through, Oh, I know what's best. I'm going to take this out, take this out, take this out. And boy, aren't they going to be so happy with me on that? That's why I got to talk was because Terry had to go, look, Tim, there's, there, there's a difference between noise and bad noise and sometimes uh you've gotta you've gotta take a look and see what absolutely has to go away and then some of the stuff that you can just leave in yeah and it's gonna build character into this yep. into this thing so as, I don't, as, dime, as dime used to say it sucks just perfect <laughs> yeah that's a good one i like that that was another yeah. one of his sayings one of his isms but yeah it sucks leave it alone sucks just perfect that's so cool. So I like that. Yeah, I talk to people every day that say they only met Dime once back in this show at this venue. Uh, it was this blah blah blah, and he changed my life because he like paid attention to me and heard everything I said. And I was I, I just think back to that, and I'm like, yeah, that's how that dude was. He made you feel like you were the only person there, and, and like like the party was for you. Like it was your birthday. That's how he made everybody feel, and Absolutely. And, and and a lot of times too, Vinny, and uh, like I like I alluded to earlier, and and yeah, it's uh, it's they they have these little meetings, and it changed their lives. And so I'm sitting here thinking, I practically lived with these cats. At one point, I did live with at Vinny's house, hmm. you know, for about six or eight months, you know, uh, and it just. I can't imagine what my life would be like had, had I not ran into these guys. Yeah. One of the miracles of me getting sober was that for the longest time I was scared to get sober because I thought Benny would resent me or he's losing his drinking buddy, hmm. you know, that kind of thing. You're a pussy. Don't do that. And what happened was the, ex couldn't even be more opposite was that he was very, Hey man, whatever you need, bro. I know you need help. I'm going to rally the guys around you. We're going to make sure that no one 
you know, tries to put any shots down your throat or cram you on any booze or anything like that. And we're going to look out for you. And that to me was that that's very, very near and dear to my heart as to the power of that brotherhood. He continued to have fun and go out and drink and, you know, cause he could, he could deal with it better than I could. And he saw that I was struggling and he helped me rather than, than chastise me for it. And I just thought, wow, that's a true friend. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a brother. So that, that to me is one of the biggest, and this was, this was many years after Dime died. This was about five or six years after Dime died. Mm. So for, for him to, to step up and do that for me and make sure that I was taken care of was, mm. was paramount into the human being I am today. So another general question for you guys. I know that the guys in Allison Chains, particularly Jerry Cantrell, ended up becoming very close with Pantera. What, do you know what the story was there exactly? They toured together on uh, while they were on Cowboys from Hell. They were warming up for Alice in Chains on the facelift tour. And so that's how they got close. They're all buddies. Jerry lives up in Oklahoma, has a house, his dad's ranch is up in Oklahoma, and we used to all just hang all the time. Hmm. Jerry would come down, stay for a week, stay at Benny's, he'd stay at Dimes. We'd all just go out drinking at night, have fun. That's you know, cool. they're just, they're just all of the same mind. Now, of course, one of the interesting parallels between Alice in Chains and Pantera is that they both started out as glam metal bands. Do you guys know why Pantera switched from glam metal to groove metal, thrash metal? I pretty much saw it as a natural evolution of where they needed to be musically because they were a product of their environment so much so that, I mean, they, they played covers and at that point in time, hair metal was big. Hmm. And then I musically speaking, and also from being a part of a, a few of those conversations in the, in the studio with them was that they decided to strike out on their own and stop so much emulating their idols, so to speak. Hmm. They, they kind of put it like this. You always, play these great songs by all these other great artists and you get to the part that's the breakdown or what they called the money riff mm, yeah. and uh it's so heavy uh why not make the whole song the money riff that was their philosophy and so i think that's what they kind of stumbled into formula wise so when it went from glam to noticeably heavier it wasn't a surprise to me because here I was seeing them on independent releases for all those years before. Mm -hmm. And then to see them on a major label was uh, I would, I would think that they would have had to have changed their, their philosophy, their, their politics, everything to be able to achieve that. And I think they did. I think they, there was a beautiful blend of uh, just their own thing, just that, that, that groove metal, that power groove thing. On that note, when you start thinking about, these guys were overnight successes and stuff of that nature. And that is so far from the truth. They, they spent a better part of a decade just honing, mm. honing their, their, their craft. Yeah. Show, show me an overnight success and I'll show you someone that is a one hit one to me uh, anyways, because most of us get to see the bottom half or the bottom uh, nine tenths of the iceberg. Mm. Uh, when we work with people, we see the struggle, we see all the crap they've gone through over the years and all the stories they tell us of, you know, doing gigs and they've all got the flu and traveling in a van and a stinky van for five years up and down the highways. You yeah. know, that's that people don't think about that part and they go, oh, my gosh, they're so famous now. It's an overnight success. And it's just simply not the case yeah. with most everyone. It's a lot of hard work. For it sure. is. It really is. And some of them put in all the hard work and they never make it, you know? Yeah, that's the, that's whatever, the whatever part. it is, you know, define it. Yeah, for sure. And I always think that like that point you just made, I think is so important because I think when, <clears throat> when people look at, I guess just in general music or the arts, you know, they might see someone that's not really successful and they might assume that person's lazy or whatever, but they don't understand that it's like, it's not one of those fields where the amount of work you put in automatically equals the amount you get out. Like there are no. bands that put in so no. much and didn't get it, you know? There's no formula. There's no mathematical equation to that. Yeah. You know, if there were, if there were, me and Tim would both be living on a yacht, <laughs> our own yachts, and have our own islands. And and because me and him work hard every day, and yeah. and you know, life's a roller coaster. It goes up and down. You know, mm -hmm. it's, 
just like the music industry. So it For is sure. what it is, you know. For sure, man. Well, and and, and to kind of add to that, you know, not not to get off on the uh, the whole the whole work ethic thing and so on and so forth. There, I can tell you, there were days, uh, you know, even back then, as as much. Uh, words can't really describe the euphoria that I can speak for myself, the euphoria that I had walking through those doors every day uh, during that period of time, knowing that, you know, hopefully we're going to get to be together for six, seven months. And that wound up to be a much longer period of time for, for, for Sterling. Mm. Um, but the euphoria that one has, you have a tendency to forget that, uh, w- when you're in that environment, it doesn't really feel like work any longer. Yeah. Um, and that's what I felt like was really unique about uh, Pantera as a whole hmm. is that it was a all for one, one for all. As a preface for all of this, one of the very first things that Sterling and I um, learned very quickly is that you're either all in or you're not going to be a part of it. Hmm. And uh, that was the work ethic. It's like, um, and we've got some funny stories that kind of deal with that too. You know, uh, as much as I love Terry, uh, Hmm. the the actual truth is, is uh, very first day that, that they walk into the studio, Terry is basically like, I don't need these two guys. Hmm. I don't need Sterling. I don't need Tim. We're going to, you know, we're going to be here for a while. Um, And, you know, my my version of the story is is that and Sterling, correct me if I'm wrong on this. It was the guys in the band that just basically kind of went, uh, "No, these are our guys, and uh, mm. we want them here." Absolutely, um, absolutely. And you know, not, not, not that Terry was trying to uh, not include us. It was he's used to working by himself without an mm. assistant or a second engineer, and and that was his. That was the way he rolled. And, uh, he was being protective of Hmm. what that bubble was, you know, uh, I think. And, and so not to, not to belittle anything about Terry, because that dude is a absolute gem of a person anyways, but, uh, no, that's, that's exactly what happened. And he was like, well, I really don't need anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, but the, uh, after, five minutes with dime and Vinny, they were like, no, these guys, we need them here. They're part of the team. They're going to help you focus on what you need to focus on. And, and that's what happened literally. That's really cool. And, you know, if, if I could add to that and it, it it turned out just so good because at some point, you know, Terry, needs to leave he needs to go back and rest Hmm. for the day that's the other thing is that a lot of people forget these sessions daniel these sessions weren't you know four or five hours these sessions were days Hmm. sometimes uh, i don't recall uh, ever a period of time that we were with pantera that we didn't go home at some point but these were very long days yeah, they were, uh, well, they were 14, 16 hour days, 15, 16 hour days. Yeah. And so I guess the point here was that it, it really kind of turned out well for everybody. Number one, it gave Sterling and I uh, an opportunity, if you will, to take care of some of the um, the mechanical, technical business, if you will, hmm. uh, that Terry very easily could do. And I'm sure. Uh, would have handled that extremely well, hmm. but uh, it's like to um, to add to that, it showed that he had confidence in us, guys. I'm going back to the hotel. Got to get some rest. We're going to be back tomorrow. Here's what I need for hmm. to happen tonight before you leave the studio. Before you know, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, arrives here's the uh the task for the day Mm -hmm. so would it be fair to say uh, if i could just jump in so would it be fair to say i guess your relationship with terry you being both you guys i guess it it developed over the course of the time you were working with him yes almost immediately Mm -hmm. yes because it took it took that what tim was just talking about it took that stuff off of terry's plate so terry could concentrate on the art of mixing Mm -hmm. You know, and and the actual task, the artistic task of what needed to happen there, his role as producer, keeping that train on the tracks, 
me and Tim are handling the mundane things like, you know, make sure the tape machine's calibrated, you know, if we need to edit, make sure we got what we need. Well, this is pre-Pro Tools, you know, or it's, it's when Pro Tools was just starting to appear on the scene. So it was all analog, 24 track, two inch tape and, and outboard gear, no plugins. You know, this was a, a real studio with real analog gear that breaks and has to be maintained. And, and so, you know, we, you know, get on the phone and call this guy because I need this piece of gear here tomorrow. You know, those kinds of things. Call Nashville, call Dream Hire Nashville, you know, and have this on, put on a truck. Things like that. You know, it's it's not it, it's not as simple as as it is today. You're talking, what, 25 years ago, yeah. you know, to, to kind of chime in. I don't know that I would ever want to go back to, you know, the days of 24 track, two inch tape and hurdles, uh, things to get past with all of that. I don't know that I would ever want to go back to that. But at the same time. Okay. I think that there is, we're, we're still exploring uncharted territory when it comes to isolation, mm -hmm. whether it's the engineer and the, uh, you know, and the band or the band members, Hey, you know, just send me the song. I'll put the vocals on at my place and I'll send it back. And, you know, and, and then no one's really rubbing the elbows with one another. It anymore. loses. I think that that's been a very big step backwards for music in general. Hmm. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I echo that to Tim because yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. In my it's view, a... I think that uh, I think the technology has opened so many. I think it's a net positive to technology, but the one big drawback is that now you don't need to spend years and years learning how to really master your vocals or to play a guitar or whatever it may be. You can just kind of do it programmed, which is great, but it also, it completely kills the necessity to have a band. And I think that's been really detrimental for rock and roll specifically. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's a really double-edged sword. And um, I don't know, man, I, I just, I would love to see a kick butt new band just really just blow up and get huge. But I feel like the, the structure of the business is not in its favor. But if a band can pull it off, it would be amazing. So fingers crossed with that one, you know? I I totally, Steve. yes, I concur with that. Not Steve. to cut you off, Sterling, but I I totally concur with that in the sense that I've always said this. And, and, and by the way, you know, I run my business this way. I tell my students to this day, I don't do anything by myself anymore. It's not because I don't trust myself. It's not because I can't do it. It's because I really feel that other people's opinions and being able to have their input and to actually be able to talk about what it is that we're doing makes the difference. Uh, I know that I'm much better when I can bounce an idea off of say Sterling, for example. Uh, hey Sterling, what do you think about, you know, it could be a freaking banjo part and it might be a great banjo part, but if it's too much of it and I'm not aware that it's too much, at least I can talk to him and go, what do you think about this? And he, if he's going to be honest with me, he's going to, well, that sucks because it's too much. You know, nowadays it's like, I'm going to send you a, a stereo mix. You're going to put the vocals down and you'll send us the tracks and then we'll, we'll weave it into the, we'll weave it into the song that's going to be. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just because I'm old school and I remember the days of, you know, having that camaraderie with, mm -hmm. With, with a band being a part, if you will, kind of the kind of the, the third wheel or the fifth wheel, whatever it might mm -hmm. be, but actually participating in the um, uh, in, in the process. And one of the things that I sincerely feel that gets lost when people start about making records and stuff like that, and absolutely nothing to take away from the bands that get to that point, but I think that. Um, there is a sense nowadays that gets lost in the sense that uh, the art form of recording has been, we're, we're literally on the verge of losing it. Hmm. And I, I think Sterling can probably echo this. Sterling and I have recently uh, kind of been joined back together um, uh, in a in a uh, instructor role if you will mm. and one of the big things that i see with a lot of these guys coming through school nowadays is that they're not willing to uh they're not willing to pay the price mm. uh to to be able to get on the uh you know to get on the ride and, and to be able to ride mm. and the sad part about that is 
is that they don't even know what they're missing because they've never gotten the opportunity to experience. I think that's what digital recording has done uh, to us all is kind of isolated a lot of us, Mm. you know, that would maybe typically be in the same room together. And, you know, just speaking for myself, I miss it a lot. Just the camaraderie of being able to hang with the same people that you're recording or to be able to uh, break bread with, you know, with the with the artists that you're going to be living with for the next six, seven months or whatever. Point being is that, you know, over the over the course, literally over the course of the last couple of years for me, uh, pretty much everything that I've even remotely thought about touching has been remote. I mean, mm. it's been very isolated. Yeah, it definitely makes developing relationships with artists a lot different than before. Speaking of which, how did your relationship with Pantera begin, Sterling? Did it have a connection with Tim in any way? Yeah, pretty much uh, the same as Tim's. We were both there at the same studio at the same time when they came in to finish Far Beyond Driven in ninety October of 93 at the Sound Lab, Dallas Sound Lab. I think it's fair to say, Daniel, you know, that uh, Sterling and I both, we were, we were big fans from the get-go before we had ever met uh, the Abbott brothers. I had met, and I think I had mentioned this in an earlier uh, discussion, with you that I had actually met their dad way before I ever met the, uh, Mm. met the Abbott brothers. So Sterling and I both kind of knew what was coming once we kind of got word, Hey, uh, you know, the guys from Pantera are coming in and uh, uh, we want to put you guys on there. I was honored to even be considered, you know, worthy to, to be on a project that big. Same. Same. I knew it was going to be huge. I was a fan since high school when I lived way out in uh, uh, San Angelo, Texas, where I was raised. And so I I had already been listening to them for years from their independent releases. Oh, back so, in the glam yeah. days, eh? Yeah, definitely. And uh, it was, uh, I didn't ever think in my wildest dreams I'd ever even meet them, much less work with them and, and live with them. So, you know, it was a very, uh, very exciting time for both of us to get to be part of that. That's so cool. Not to mention Terry Day. Jeez. Yeah. Master. When it came down to the Far Beyond Driven record, and I think it's very fair to say this, and I may have even mentioned this before, Mm -hmm. but Terry was the glue that held all of us together. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, He was the mother hen, if you will. Uh Uh, We would have, you know, we would have a pep talk by Terry. Uh, I don't know that it happened every day, but it would happen at least once a week. It's like, guys, you know. Uh, whatever y'all do, you need to be aware that every move that you make could be uh, a, it, it could be a huge detriment if you make a bad move somewhere. Hmm. And so, you know, you got to take care. Don't be idiots out there. Yep. Go have fun. But, at, uh, you know, yep. we need to be back tomorrow. So don't, yeah. you know, don't yeah. go out and do stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Not for sure, man. So- yep. And I laugh at that because we always did stuff that we weren't supposed to be doing. Totally. <laughs> Totally. Well, I was f- 23 years old. That's the fun of life, man. You got to do it. Jeez. Are you kidding? You know, you're called it, you're a teenager still. I don't know about you guys, but when I, you know, when I was that age and I was told not to go do something, that was the very first thing that I went immediately to do. Immediately. 100%. It. 100%. When you get told not to do something, even if you don't want to do it, you're doing it just because you're told not to do it. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you take that and multiply it by about 20. When you tell Dimebag that you can't go do something, it's like, Hold my beer and watch this. Uh huh. Go do this. Uh huh. You're gonna go. <laughs> that is awesome. You're gonna go. <laughs> That's so funny. So I have one more question about how the band recorded music. I know you touched on this a bit earlier, but in general, when the band would record, would they usually record off the floor together, or would they typically record in isolation? When they built their own place, it was just the one open live room, and they would start that way. They would start by tracking live off the floor. That's how they got that feel because they're all playing off of one one another. Mm-hmm. So and then and then Dime would go back and and uh, redo the guitars to match Vinny a little better and to match himself a little bit better. But most of that that you're hearing is uh, live takes, like live a, a live foundation for sure, rhythmically. Rex and and Vinny most of the time were live. 
And would Phil be part of that, or would he do the vocal? No, I mean, he would be part of the writing sessions when they would write mm -hmm. and and put start putting things together. But uh, like Trinkill, he wasn't there for it all. He would mm. he did all that from New Orleans. But uh, reinventing the steel, he was there all the time. 